Welcome everyone to uh, today's webinar, uh, Tax Reform and Impact Mortgage Bankers. My name is Jared Frost. I'm a tax partner here at the firm and uh, lead the tax side of our mortgage banking practice. Wanted to uh, address just a few housekeeping items with you and then I'll introduce our, pre our presenters um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So just so everybody knows, all participants are currently placed on listen only or mute mode. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type those in um, on the webinar dashboard, and we will do our best to answer them um, either during the presentation or at the end of the, most likely at the end of the presentation, um, time permitting. Um, if we don't have time to answer all the questions, we will definitely follow up with you directly and ensure that those get answered. And uh, just so you know, a, a copy of today's uh, recording of the webinar as well as the slide deck will be emailed to all the participants following the webinar. Those that are uh, trying to qualify for CPE uh, today, there's a couple things that you need to, to be aware of. One is that there will be three poll questions. Oh, there it is, sorry. There will be three poll questions um, throughout the presentation. We need you to answer all three of those. Um, if you miss those, then we can't, we can't give you the CPE. You, just so you know, you do not have necessarily have to answer the poll question correctly, but we do need you to submit an answer. Um, also, following today's webinar, there will be a survey that will appear on your screen, and we need you to complete that survey. So if you do those two things, complete the poll questions and the survey, um, then we'll send you a, a CPE certificate of completion, and uh, those will be emailed to the participants um, in, the, in the next few days. With that, I'll go ahead and introduce today's presenters. Um, Jake Lawrence and Gina West, uh, two senior tax managers um, that are in our mortgage banking practice. Both have uh, years of experience in our, in our mortgage banking practice and are um, well equipped to, to handle today's presentation uh, regarding the recent tax legislation that passed uh, just here a, a few weeks ago. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Lawrence, who will um, introduce, introduce today's topic and, and get going on the webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Appreciate you guys joining us. Um, look forward to the opportunity to present today. And before we dive into um, the scheduled or outlined topics that you see on your screen, I just wanted to mention a couple other housekeeping items in, in regards to our webinar today. Certainly, um, the Tax Reform Act that's been passed is um, very complex. Uh, there's a lot of information contained in the bill. And so, uh, based on that fact and knowing that we've only got the actual code and some committee reports that we've been working off of, um, there's obviously a lot more guidance that we're hoping to receive in the way of um, regulations, case law, revenue rulings, procedures. But know that that information is going to take time to get disseminated from the IRS and the powers that be. So having said that, certainly our goal today is going to be to uh, tackle these topics very high level and just try to give everyone an overview of some of the highlights and things that we have found uh, may impact uh, the mortgage industry and particularly you as, as uh, owners or people that are in charge of running these businesses. So uh, please note that we'll do our best to cover as much as we can in the amount of time that we have. but. Uh, to cover all the topics in depth in an hour just isn't going to be possible. And as Jared mentioned, we certainly do want to take time for questions, but knowing how much material we need to cover, we may uh, hopefully have a few minutes at the end for questions, but please send them as you have them. And if we don't get to them throughout the webinar today, we'll be sure to uh, provide answers to you after the fact via email or some other uh, manner and getting you responses to your specific questions. So, with that being said, we'll just quickly look at our, our topical outline and the things that we hope to cover today in our webinar. Uh, if you look up at, the, at your slides, we've got um, business-related deductions and exclusions, depreciation and other cost recovery items, C-Corp and other miscellane miscellaneous items, uh, conversion from pass-through to C-Corp, uh, our thoughts on that, um, deductions for pass-through income, uh, maybe what you've heard as, as qualified business income or QBI, um, some rules changes to the partnership technical termination uh, rules, uh, some, some very high-level personal return items that may impact owners. Um, we'll look at some basic state tax considerations, a few
few 409 Cap A reminders, and then uh, at the very end, we'll try to tackle just a few thoughts around some audit elections that um, aren't necessarily part of the current legislation, but do uh, take effect uh, uh, this year. So we'll jump right into our, our first topic here of uh, limitations uh, of deductions by employers of entertainment expenses. So in this latest legislation, they made some changes to types of uh, entertainment expenses that can be deducted. And essentially, uh, starting 1-1-2018, uh, the new law states that, that no deduction will be allowed for the following uh, items. Any activities that are considered entertainment, amusement, or recreation, membership dues for any club organized for business, pleasure, recreation, or other social purposes, or a facility or a portion of a facility used in connection with any of the above. So essentially, the new legislation has eliminated uh, what we've typically seen as entertainment expenses. Um, so a thought that, that we've had on our end is certainly in the past, you know, we've um, looked through, you know, companies' meals and entertainment expenses and, and tried to identify what's, what's deductible, what's not. Um, essentially, going forward, um, the breakout will need to be any entertainment expenses that are incurred. Um, it would be helpful if they're booked into a separate account because none of those will be uh, deductions going forward under this under this new legislation. Um, in addition to uh, the changes to the entertainment expenses, they've also uh, added some new limitations and rules around um, fringe benefits related to meals, meals and the deductibility of, of certain types of meals. So again, uh, starting in, in 2018, uh, the new law generally retains the 50% deduction limitation for food and beverage expenses associated with trader business, as we've seen in the past. But under the new law, uh, they've also applied that 50% limitation to what we've previously seen or previously previously classified as uh, potentially 100% deductible uh, meals. So as you can see from the slide, uh, where they've applied this new 50% limitation to the previous 100% deductible items is food and beverages provided to employees as de minimis fringe benefits, meals provided at an eating facility that meet the requirements for an on-premises dining facility, so any in-house cafeteria or any of those types of uh, facilities, and then finally, number three, meals provided on the premises to employees for the convenience of the employer. And I know in our particular industry, in the, in the accounting world, this is a big one during our busy seasons that certainly has impacted us and will impact our business, but may also impact you know, some of your businesses where you provide these types of meals for uh, loan officers and other things that are working late to get things done towards the end of the month or the end of the year. Um, and then I wanted to just make a quick note in regards to this 50% uh, limitation on these particular items that based on the way the current legislation is written after 2025, um, there'll be no deduction allowed for items one, two, and three on this slide. So they've given us kind of a break the next few years, and then if no changes to the legislation take place in 2025, there'll be no, no deduction allowed for any of these items. So certainly a change to what we've, from what we've seen or experienced in the past in regards to uh, meal expenses being deductible. Um, let's see here, we also want to just make note of a couple other of the changes to some of the other uh, small fringe benefits that they've made um, part of this legislation. As you can see, uh, the new law states that no deduction will be allowed for the following transportation fringe benefits. Uh, one, deductions for transportation benefits such as qualified parking expenses and subway or mass transit cards provided by the employer. And then also they've uh, limited the deductions or taken away the deductions for transportation expenses that are the equivalent of commuting for employees. So things such as van pools, ride shares, any of those types of uh, expenses that were previously deductible uh, also now fit under the non-deductible category per the new legislation. Uh, not noted on the slides here, but I did want to make mention of it. Um, they have made a small change to um, the deductibility of some of the items that under the Employee Achievement Awards. Um, and the new uh, legislation has amended or changed the definition of what tangible personal property uh, includes or excludes that uh, previously has been awarded for length of service awards or safety. Um, and just to note there, there's no change to the amount. They're still allowing $400 you know, per individual. However, uh, 
the definition now of what is excluded or what's n now no longer deductible includes cash, cash equivalents, gift cards or equivalents, um, or vacations, meals, lodging, tickets to theater or sporting events, stocks, bonds, other securities, and, and items of a similar nature. So they've really tightened up the definition of what is allowed as a an achievement award or, or what's classified or qualifies as tangible personal property that can be deducted under those under those award programs. So certainly we know we'll get some questions on that and we can discuss that in more detail. Um, but I just wanted to make a quick note of that before we move on to our next our next slide. Um, a big one or a big change to the um, per this legislation that that will affect most businesses going forward, again noted here, paid after 1231.17, so starting in 2018 is um, all businesses, whether operating as a C corp or a flow through, um, will be allowed a deduction for trader business interest. Please note this doesn't include investment interest. Um, incurred during the taxable year only to the extent the total amount of such interest does not exceed the sum of the following. So um, basically you're gonna be allowed a deduction for business interest up to the amount of one interest income of the business during that year, plus 30% of the business's earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. So they're um, putting some limitations on how much interest expense will be, de be deductible uh, each year um, as you incur it. And then I wanted to just make a note that um, beginning after 2021, the 30% of the business earnings, they tighten up the what's what's included in that to basically include earnings before interest and taxes. So they'll no longer allow appreciation and amortization to be included in that calculation, which kind of further could further potentially limit that deduction. Um, and then also just as a note, and uh, the, the limits on the business interest deduction are applied at the entity level and then also again at the individual level. And as we've noted, um, and in looking through the legislation, this calculation can become very complex, um, especially when you're trying to calculate that 30%. Uh, there's lots of moving parts that can be taken into, into account as you're calculating that 30%. So certainly we don't have time today to go into the details of those types of calculations, but did want to note that, um, that there is some complexity surrounding this new calculation regarding the deductibility of business interest. Um, in conjunction, they uh, did put in a provision that any deduction, interest deduction that is disallowed in a, in a taxable year as a result of the new limitation um, will be allowed to be carried forward and can be deducted in future years, uh, once again, subject to, to that same limitation um, that's applicable in the current year. And again, just wanted to note here that there are some additional rules, particular or specific to partnerships and S-Corps um, in regards to this use or calculation of uh, and use of the carry forward of these um, disallowed business interest deductions. And again, we don't have time today to go into um, those the specifics, but note that you know, if, if the current business you're operating is operating under one of these types, that there are some additional uh, rules and things that can be looked at to allow for some potentially additional uh, business interest deductions um, that aren't available to C-Corps. Um, so jumping to kind of the next uh, topic on our outline, which was the depreciation and other cost recovery items. Um, they've made some changes to the uh, bonus depreciation rules um, going forward. And we wanted to just kind of point out some of the highlights of these changes, um, but, but note again, as with most of this, uh, legislation. There are some complexities behind this that um, that, that make this, um, you know, a lot more information than we can cover today. Um, but the highlights here for the the bonus depreciation, um, they they made a change that any assets purchased or placed in service during the tax year starting 927 2017 through the 22 tax year uh, will be permitted a uh, deduction of 100%. So basically, they're allowing for 100% bonus depreciation. Um, if the assets are purchased and placed in service within that window of time. Um, they noted that the qualifying assets or assets that will qualify for this 100% bonus are equipment, furniture, and other tangible personal property, which is similar to what they've allowed in the past. But didn't want to note under the new legislation, which is a significant change from the past, 
that um, the bonus depreciation deductions now apply to both new and used business assets acquired by purchase, whereas in the past it only applied to new assets. So they've expanded what qualifies under the bonus depreciation rules, uh, again, to include both new and used. The one caveat about used items that I've noted here is um, those items cannot have been previously owned or purchased uh, by the, the current purchasing taxpayer, and those assets can't um, be acquired from a related party. So they do put some, some strings or some limitations around the um, used property that can be eligible for bonus depreciation. Also just wanted to note here, as you can see, um, that they have implemented a phase out of the bonus depreciation that they've um, included in this legislation. So starting in tax year 2023, they will reduce the uh, bonus depreciation by 20% per year until it's completely phased out. So as you can see there, it'll be 80% bonus in 2023, 60% in 2024, 40% in 2025, and I believe that it will uh, bonus depreciation under the current legislation will be completely phased out uh, by the 2027 uh, tax year. So again, they've definitely uh, allowed for some, some additional expensing under the bonus depreciation program, but um, we'll also be phasing it out currently under the, under the legislation to where there'll be no more bonus allowed. Uh, another uh, area under the depreciation cost recovery um, section of the new legislation is the uh, increases to, to section 179 expensing. Um, They've upped the limits uh, of what's eligible for 179, and they've, they've raised the amount from 500,000 to 1 million of asset purchases, and they've also uh, increased the phase-out limit for 179 deductions from the $2 million threshold to now the $2.5 million threshold. Um, and they've also uh, made some changes or um, added some items to the definition of, of what qualified real property uh, means under Section 179, and they've uh, changed that definition to include the following improvements to non-residential um, real property, and that includes roofs, heating systems, ventilation and air conditioning property, fire protection and alarm systems, and security systems. And just wanted to make a note that this 179 uh, expensing is eligible for these types of uh, qualified real property improvements if made to um, uh, previously owned or currently owned buildings. They don't apply to new building purchases. Um, so the note here is that these, these things are eligible for 179 if you uh, these improvements are made to um, buildings that are currently in use. Um, some other kind of some other high level miscellaneous um, recovery items that we just wanted to point out and touch on um, were some, some small changes to um, the deductibility of uh, research and development expenditures. So as noted here on the slide, starting in 2022, um, R&D expenses will no longer be fully deductible in the year they incurred, but these R&D expenditures uh, will have to be amortized over a five-year period um, going forward. And we did want to note that if any of the R&D that your company may be involved in is conducted outside of the United States, um, it, it's automatically subject to a 15-year amortization period, um, not the five-year period. So just wanted to point that out and make a note of that. Um, an additional note, starting in 2022 as well, uh, R&D expenditures for the development of software um, will also now be subject to the new capitalization rules. I just wanted to note here that there may be some, there are some uh, other rules that come into play in regards to the development of software um, that certainly we, we don't have time to cover today, but um, you can have a discussion at a future point if, if you know, if you're in, in the process or in, involved in development of software. Um, the other thing that we wanted to note in regards to the R&D expenditures, in the last note here on the slide, um, in the case of a retired, abandoned, or disposed of, of property to which uh, specified R&D expenditures have been paid or incurred, any remaining basis in that property may not be recovered in a year of retirement, abandonment, or disposal, but uh, must continue to be amortized over the remaining five-year period. So once that five-year period, um, that five-year window starts in 2022 and is applied to R&D expenses, even if those assets are retired, abandoned, or disposed of, 
um, short of that five-year amortization window, um, you'll still be required to amortize the rest of that cost over that five-year window and won't be allowed an immediate reduction of the remaining um, expense. So, um, jumping to our next our next topic, um, we have, um, we'll move to kind of the C-Corp items that are specific to C-Corps and, and then some other miscellaneous items that, that um, may be specific to C-Corps or just uh, all the business types in general. Um, obviously, the big one here is the uh, corporate tax rate reduction. So, certainly under the new law, they've done away with the graduated rates that we were, were accustomed to at C corps of the 15, 25, 34, and 35 percent rates, and have now gone to just a flat 21 percent tax rate um, for C corp income. And in conjunction with that um, rate change, they've also made some small changes to the uh, dividends received deductions that are available for C corps. And as noted here, they've lowered the 80 percent dividend received deduction amount. Uh, for dividends from 20% or more owned corporations to 65%, and they've lowered the 70% dividend received deduction for dividends from less than 20% owned corporations to 50%. Um, so these are kind of two changes they made in regards, or at the same time, they implemented the new flat rate of 21%. So um, I think we have our first um, poll question. So if you'll take just a minute to answer this question, we'd, we'd greatly appreciate it. All righty, we appreciate everybody um, answering that question. In case those that are keeping score out there and want to know what the correct answer is to this particular question, uh, hopefully nobody missed it, but it's, it's B, it's 21%. So um, we'll continue to move on with our, our next topic under the C Corp and other miscellaneous items. Um, also under the new legislation, they have um, eliminated the alternative minimum tax that was applicable to C Corp. So, um, as noted, they're effective for tax years beginning after 12/31/17. AMT tax is eliminated. And just a couple of notes in regards to the AMT. Uh, any AMT credit carryovers to tax years after 12/31/17 uh, may be utilized to the extent of the taxpayer's regular tax liability. So they're letting letting you use some of the AMT credits to offset regular tax liability starting with the 2018 tax year. And then a further note here is for tax years beginning in uh, 18, 19, and 20, to the extent that AMT credit carryovers exceed regular tax liability, 50% of the excess AMT credit carryovers are now refundable. And then as noted, any AMT credits remaining will be fully refundable in 2021. So um, just wanted to point these, these two quick notes out in regards to the uh, elimination of the AMT tax in regards to C-Corps. Um, Moving to uh, changes to the net operating loss deductions, um, there's kind of been three important changes that they've implemented in regards to NOLs, um, and so we just want to point those out very quickly. Um, one, the ability to carry back NOLs for up to two years from the year the NOLs are generated has been eliminated. So starting in, with the 2018 tax year, all NOLs that are generated must be carried forward. The 20-year limit for NOL carry forwards has also been eliminated. So again, starting with 2018, all NOLs can be carried forward indefinitely for use in future years. And then item number three, um, taxpayers will no longer be able to use NOL carry forwards to offset all of their taxable income in future years. And so we just wanted to point out that starting with NOLs generated in 2018, um, taxpayers will be permitted to use NOL carry forwards to offset no more than 80% of their taxable income. So wanted to point out that obviously NOLs generated in 2017 or from the 2017 calendar tax year, those can still be carried back two years and also can still be used to offset 100% of, of 2017 taxable income. So these NOL changes 
really take effect or start to affect NOLs that are generated with the 2018 tax year. And the final note in regards to the NOLs um, is that this limitation applies regardless of whether the entity type is an individual or a C Corp. So they've extended this limitation to the use of any NOLs um, starting with 2018 and going forward. Um, another item is the uh, limitation on the use of excess business losses. And so under the new law, taxpayers will be limited in the use of flow-through business losses from all flow-through entities each year to offset their non-business uh, income. And so we just wanted to point out kind of quickly here um, that the excess loss limit applies when business losses exceed the following amounts, uh, 500000 for married individuals filing jointly and 250000 for other individuals. And um, it's noted that in the legislation that any business loss in excess of the above mentioned limitations will be carried forward, but it will be treated as a net operating loss. Um, so it will be subject to those same 80% limitations that we just mentioned on the previous slide that are applicable to both C-Corps and individuals. Um, and we did want to note with this excess business loss, and I, I know Gene is going to touch on this a little further into the presentation, um, but the, this, uh, these limitations in the use of these excess business losses could be impacted by the QBI calculation and other um, items of income and deduction that we just don't have Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into today and, and, and talk about how those can impact this, this use of excess business losses, but didn't want to note that certainly there are other things that may factor into um, how you get to those threshold amounts. Um, a couple more items here in regards to uh, C-Corps and other miscellaneous things is uh, we just wanted to point out that um, certainly there are, are, we have some thoughts or ways that you can maybe limit the second uh, shareholder level, level of tax. Just a quick few thoughts here. Um, with, the, with the C Corp structure, a taxpayer may have significant control over when the shareholder level of tax is actually incurred. And certainly limiting distributions of profits, um, i.e. issuing dividends to shareholders for a significant period of time can greatly reduce and in certain cases almost eliminate the second level of tax. And the best way to delay, delay shareholder level of tax is by reinvesting profits back into the operation of the business rather than issuing those dividends. But we did just want to note that um, there's certainly, in, in some cases, um, there may be some limitations or there may be, uh, depending on how you hold those, uh, that, that, that cash as retained earnings that could be subject to the accumulated earnings tax um, if it's deemed that you know, the retained earnings amount is in excess of what reasonable, the reasonable needs are of the business. And then in regards to state, tax, state taxes paid uh, for C-Corps, unlike individual taxpayers who are limited to the 10000 of property tax and or state taxes paid, C-Corps still be entitled to the deduction treatment for the payment of state taxes paid. So um, C Corp certainly will get to get still deduct their, their state taxes paid. Um, and then let's see here. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide. We just wanted to point out since you'll have this that starting uh, in 2018, like kind exchange treatment will be limited to uh, real property only. Um, no longer will they allow um, the exchange of, of tangible personal property, it will be limited to uh, real property. So just wanted to point that out. Um, and then did want to make a note here about uh, changes to the rules for uh, tax year of inclusion income or uh, what we've heard to refer to as kind of the book conformity rules. Um, so in general, for an accrual basis taxpayer, uh, an amount is included in income when all the events have occurred that fix the right to receive such income and the amount thereof can be determined with reasonable accuracy or what we've referred to as the all events test, when all those uh, items are met, um, unless an exception permits deferral or exclusion. Now, under the new law, there's been a slight tweak to this. And so under the new law, the accrual method taxpayer must recognize income no later than the tax year in which the item is recognized as revenue on an applicable financial statement. So i.e. the all events test is satisfied no later than the year in which the revenue is recognized for financial accounting purposes. And we did just want to note very quickly that uh, the change, this change in the law, uh, will affect income deferral treatment uh, of interest rate lock commitments and the corresponding hedge. Um, and so, you know, going forward, starting with the 2018 tax year, um, for tax return purposes, those income items will uh, have to be included in taxable income in the same year that they're included for financial statement purposes. Um, and we did want to note that there are very limited exceptions to this new book conformity rule. Uh, the big one that impacts mortgage uh, companies being 
um, that this limit does not apply to uh, income earned in association or connection with mortgage servicing rights, and then a few uh, other items that we mentioned here, uh, long-term contracts and installment agreements. Um, and certainly we, we recognize that we don't you know, have time in this, in this presentation to dive into any more of the details regarding this book conformity, but certainly would encourage you to have discussions with uh, your, your tax advisors uh, or feel free to, you know, obviously call us here at Richie May. We'd be happy to talk through um, these specific changes with you. Um, with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Gina, and she's going to talk more specifically about some of the other uh, items on our, on our top of the list here. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to kind of kick us off here going forward with just a few thoughts on um, conversions from S corporations to C corporations. Um, that you might uh, find applicable if, if this is an area that um, is uh, of consideration or, or potentially in, in progress for you. Um, so one thing that um, did change is that the concept of 481 adjustments, which is um, uh, the ad income adjustment related to a specific method change. So these adjustments of eligible terminated S corporation um, attributable to the revocation of S status will be taken into account rateably over six years. Um, this example here, cash to accrual method, is, is fairly common, um, not necessarily so much for lenders as lenders are required to be on the accrual method, um, but this is a little different than standard method change rules. Those are typically on average four-year spreads. Um, <clears throat> an eligible terminated S corporation is any C corporation, which is an S corporation the day before December 22nd, 2017, which was the date that uh, President Trump signed this legislation. Um, also, during the two-year period beginning on December 22nd, 2017, um, the S corporation election revokes its status. And all of the owners of which on the date the S corporation election is revoked are the same owners and in identical proportions as owners on December 22nd. So very specific uh, criteria for this um, six-year uh, rateable um, pickup. Uh, keep in mind that, again, this, this particular six-year spread is specific, specifically related to adjustments resulting from terminations. Um, again, otherwise, the normal method change rules apply. Um, a common example we see for lenders um, is the uh, method change related to uh, loans held for sale valuations and changing to the mark-to-market -mark method. That typically has a, a four-year uh, spread on picking up the income adjustments. Um, another item to kind of consider here is that a 3.8% Medicare tax for applicable passive investors will still apply. Um, this is uh, an item that will impact potential C corporation dividends and or S corporation pass through income. So this is still in play um, and definitely an item to consider um, as you think about you know, your S status versus uh, traditional C corporation. So some other changes related to conversions are related to sort of the post-termination treatment of distributions. So um, what is sort of the same um, that hasn't changed with the new uh, tax laws is that this post-transition termination period um, distribution by an eligible terminated S corporation um, is treated first as made out of AAA or the accumulated adjustments account. So those are typically tax-free to the extent of basis, and then they would be capital gains. Um, then they're typically um, treated as made out of E&P or earnings and profits, and then those are typically dividend treatment. So the portion here that's new is really the second half um, where distributions after this PTTP period would be treated as coming out of AAA or accumulated E&P in the same ratio as the amount of the corporation's AAA bears to the amount of accumulated E&P. So it's sort of an extension on this beneficial treatment where a portion of these future distributions um, might be uh, potentially tax-free. Um, we haven't seen any specific time period limitation on this, so for now, um, that seems to be a, a, an attractive change that, that has been made. Um, note that this PTTP period is typically one year after the last day as an S corporation. So again, just kind of a reminder that Determining to revoke your S status is really not, you know, a simple 
um, as simple as just looking at the tax rate reduction. Um, there's a lot of considerations around, you know, double taxation related to dividends, um, other items related to holding periods, um, exit strategies, cash needs, um, amongst other criteria. So definitely, um, you know, reach out to, to your advisors um, with any questions or, or things you might need to more specifically analyze um, related to your business. So this is a, a significant change. I'm sure you've all been hearing about it, but this concept of qualified business income. Um, I'll kind of go quite a bit into detail on this. Um, so we've got quite a few slides and some examples, but I'll, I'll try to move as quickly as I can with, with the time period that we've got to go over this. Um, so for tax years beginning after 1231.17 and before 2026, this will be a common date um, range that you're going to hear pretty much throughout the rest of the presentation. But this new section, uh, 199A, has been added for qualified business income. And under this section, a non-corporate taxpayer who has QBI from a partnership, S corporation, or sole proprietorship is allowed to deduct 20% of QBI earned from a trader business. So this is a complex calculation. We'll go a bit into the details here. I apologize if it's a bit um, sort of, um, you know, complex language, but um, for now, this is the details we've got from the code. So this deduction is subject to limits, um, but is basically the, the lesser of um, kind of the details just described here, combined qualified business income of the taxpayer or 20% of the excess um, of the taxable income of the taxpayer over the sum of net capital gain and the aggregate amount of the qualified cooperative dividends um, of the taxpayer. So it's the lesser of this plus um, the lesser of 20% of the aggregate amount of the qualified cooperative dividends um, or taxable income. So, you know, as you'll kind of see in later slides, I'd kind of like to generalize this for you or, or simplify it, maybe oversimplify it for you. Um, but basically, the deduction is 20% of QBI um, unless taxable income is less than certain thresholds or the wage cap is effective. And we'll talk a bit. Um, further about the wage cap on, on some later slides. Um, so generally, you know, we're, we feel that um, lenders may be affected less frequently by the wage cap due to the significant compensation costs in the industry, but certainly it, it can, you know, potentially still come into play. So we'll, we'll go through that um, in more detail um, here in a, in a few slides. So something new kind of on this concept is um, that a 20% deduction uh, does not actually impact AGI or adjusted gross income, um, but rather is a deduction reducing taxable income. So the new kind of concept on this is just that, you know, it's not an itemized deduction. It's, it's really a new deduction here. So our returns are going to look, you know, a little bit different here going forward. Um, QBI is, is defined here. Uh, generally as ordinary income effectively connected with the conduct of a trader business um, within the U.S. Um, and does not include investment-related income deductions or losses, some examples there, um, as well as guaranteed payments from partnerships. So we're going to launch our, our second PPE question here. All right, so um, thanks for answering those questions. Um, the uh, correct answer on that one was section 199A or um, option A on that list. So um, that is the new code section. So kind of continuing on with this QBI concept, um, 
keep in mind that the deduction is further limited by this sort of wage concept that we touched on on the previous slides. But basically, it's limited by the greater of 50% of the W-2 wages with respect to the trader business, or what they're sort of calling the W-2 wage limit or the wage cap, um, or the sum of 25% of the W-2 wages um, plus 2.5% of the unadjusted cost basis. Um, of all qualified property. So this second item here was really um, probably some great lobbying that, that was done here, but it's, it should be beneficial to, to people who own businesses with large real estate holdings but have few actual employees. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, we, we think that the 50% wage limit will probably be um, more applicable to lenders, but however, um, keep in mind that depending um, with the, just the nature of the industry, you may not necessarily even have um, that come into play, but we'll touch on that in some of the examples. Um, for a partnership or S corporation, um, each partner or shareholder is treated as having W-2 wages for the tax year in an amount equal to his or her allocable share um, of the W-2 wages of the entity for the year for this calculation. So we've gotten a ton of questions on this. Um, but this is, um, you know, this will give you a, a large chunk of allocable wages when this calculation comes into play um, at the individual level related to lenders specifically. So um, just keep that in mind. And again, just note that the, the QBI deduction is not a simple calculation and, and has multiple limits. So kind of as, as mentioned on the last slide um, for those real estate um, uh, to the two and a half percent portion of that uh, wage cap. Um, qualified property means tangible, depreciable property, which is held um, as, and available for use in the qualified trader business at the close of the tax year. So that's sort of just the, the definition there. Um, this is a big one, the second item here. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions on this, not just today, but, but over the last month or so. Um, but it's the concept around the deduction of QBI um, related to specified service businesses. So <clears throat> overall, um, the deduction does not apply to specified service businesses exceeding certain dollar limits. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but the, the definition of, of businesses that are included in this item um, really correlates very closely with sort of the professional service corporation concepts under this 1202 uh, E3A code section. So um, this really includes businesses involving performance of services and as you can see there in the fields of health, law, engineering, architecture, accounting, actuarial science, performing arts, etc. cetera. Um, but really the key here is, and why we feel kind of as mentioned below that lenders should not fall into this definition is um, this item related to um, if the trader business um, really has the principal asset uh, being the reputation or skill of one or more of its employees. Um, so we, we do not feel that, that lenders fall into this service definition. Um, however, there was some strong lobbying done here as well, because um, there is a specific exclusion from this definition for engineering and architecture, as well as trades or businesses that involve um, performance of services that consist of investment type activities. Um, so again, we um, service businesses do still get a deduction potentially. Um, it just looks a little bit different. Um, we won't have an example specifically on that, but again, mainly because we wanted to focus here on lenders. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind that um, neither the wage asset limit or the limitation on specified service businesses applies to taxpayers with taxable income below a threshold amount, and we'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, also, the deduction is then phased out rateably in the case of these specified service businesses or gradually becomes subject to the wage and asset limitation for the other businesses to the extent that um, taxable income of the taxpayer exceeds the threshold amount. So again, very, very complex area. So to kind of further define these thresholds, um, the W-2 wage limit does not apply for taxpayers with taxable income below the threshold amount. And as you can see here, it's uh, 315,000 for joint filers and 157,500 for other individuals. This will be indexed uh, as well for inflation. Um, 
the application of this limit um, is phased in for individuals with taxable income exceeding those thresholds above. And it essentially has sort of an additional 100,000 component for joint filers and 50,000 for individuals. So you'll kind of see this in, um, in our examples here shortly. But basically, you know, assuming a flow-through entity is not limited by the specified service business and wage asset limitations, the maximum effective tax rate on its profits uh, will be approximately 29.6 percent, and and basically that's 80 percent times the highest uh, effective rate of 37 percent. Um, so really, overall, this represents um, a 10 percent reduction from the current rate structure. And again, this is based on uh, a full 20% QBI deduction, which may not always be the case, but you know, for simplification purposes. Okay, so here's the fun part for today. Um, kind of going through this initial example of what a QBI deduction calculation might look like um, when it is not subject to, to limitations, where you're essentially getting a full 20% um, deduction. So. What we've started with here, and I know the slide's a little bit small, but hopefully afterwards when the slide deck is sent out, um, you know, you can look at this in a little bit more detail. But um, we've started with some assumptions of um, $2 million of taxable income, um, as well as assuming that the qualified business income portion of that amount is essentially equivalent to so $2 million. In real life, you know, it's possible that overall taxable income could be higher or lower than your QBI amount. Um, but for simplification, we kind of started with that. We're also assuming $800,000 of the allocable share of wages to the taxpayer from the qualified business. And then we also assumed um, $150,000 for unadjusted cost basis of qualified property for the, the wage asset limitation calculations. So as you kind of look down further into this phase out applicability section there in the middle, you can see that taxable income is greater than both of the threshold amounts. So the initial threshold of the 157.5 that we touched on earlier um, for single and 315 for married. Um, and then as well for the phase in of that additional $50,000 and $100,000 component, um, the $2 million is in excess of both of these. So with that being said, um, when you compare them down below in the QBI deduction calculation section, you can see that the initial tentative QBI deduction, which is just a flat, flat 20% of the $2 million, the 400, um, that happens to be equivalent to the greater of the wages or the wage asset limitation, which um, also happens to be $400,000. And again, that's 50% of the 800,000 happens to be the higher number there. So um, in this example, because there's no differential there between the tentative deduction and the um, potential wage cap, um, the allowable QBI deduction is basically then the lesser of um, your traditional QBI income amount um, or the amounts based on the taxable income limitation. So in this case, you're getting um, the $400,000 deduction, which is the true kind of initial 20% amount that we discussed earlier. So. I know that's kind of a lot to go through, but um, a good kind of caveat to this would be in this example, say if wages increased from 800,000 to 900,000, you'd effectively get the same deduction. You'd still get the $400,000. You'd still max out at the 20% um, deduction. If wages were lower, um, we'll actually kind of go into what that looks like here. And this is where um, you'll kind of see the impact of a limited deduction. So going from the last example where um, we were using the $800,000 of wages, um, this example uses $600,000. All of their assumptions um, are the same. So in this example, while the um, taxable income is still greater than the threshold amount, as you can kind of see there in the middle, the wage cap now does take effect because 50% of the $600,000 is only 300, but your tentative QBI deduction was 400,000. So now you have this $100,000 differential that now impacts your ability to take the full 20%. So now your allowable QBI deduction is the lesser of the qualified business income amount, which is that um, amount of QBI deduction less 
the reduction for the wage cap for three hundred thousand, or the amount based on <clears throat> your taxable income limitation. So again, here your allowable deduction is the lower of those, so three hundred thousand. So effectively, you're only getting a fifteen percent uh, QBI deduction compared to the other example of getting a full twenty percent. So um, the only other thing I wanted to mention here very quickly is that in the event um, that your taxable income was lower than these threshold amounts, um, that's where um, you should just get a flat uh, deduction of the 20% of QBI and wouldn't be subject to the wage asset um, limitation. So kind of keep that in mind as well. All right, we're going to touch on a few um, sort of additional items related to tax reform here, but another area was um, technical termination concept changes for partnerships. So um, in the past, under this 708B1B code section, a partnership was considered terminated if within any 12-month uh, period, there is a sale or exchange of 50% or more of the total interest in the partnership capital um, and profits. And this created some deemed contribution, deemed distribution <laughs> issues here that you can see in the second point. But what that allowed taxpayers to do was um, potentially to have stepped up basis in certain cases, which then created some ability to have, you know, sometimes additional depreciable assets. So that was the old law. Um, with the tax reform bill, um, this particular code section was repealed beginning after 2017. Um, but keep in mind that the repeal does not change um, the code section 708B1A, which is just strictly, you know, if, if there's no part of the business that's still in operation, um, then that partnership is still terminated. Um, but for the technical termination um, concepts, you know, what we're going to find here is that there, there's going to be fewer opportunities to step up basis. And so this could be quite, quite a big deal for um, transactions that occur with partnerships and, and M&A deals, potentially. So um, keep that in mind. So for some individual updates, I'm, I'm going to run through these a little, a little bit quicker. Um, hopefully, if you've got any further questions, we can you know, get you additional information if needed. But the tax rate changes um, overall kind of dropped 2 to 5% by bracket, generally. Um, and the bracket ranges for the income for those ranges have also changed um, quite significantly. So just note that um, the net investment income tax, as I mentioned earlier, the 3.8% on passive income does still apply. So that's sort of in addition to, to these income tax brackets. So the, the standard deduction has also changed. Um, it's effectively doubled. Um, so for married filing joint, it's 24. For individuals, it's now 12. Um, this will be indexed for inflation, um, and all increases will end after 2025. Um, this next one, probably a big ticket item for, for our lenders here. Um, the mortgage interest deduction limitations have changed. So the deduction for tax years after 17 and before 2026. Um, will now be limited on um, limited to interest on $750,000 of acquisition indebtedness versus the old law, which was a million dollars. Um, so, kind of as noted there, there will be some grandfather rules that can apply, and I'll touch on that in a moment. But this will change um, potentially, you know, the deductions on, on a lot of taxpayers' returns. Um, also, note that the interest deduction. Um, will no longer be allowed for interest on home equity indebtedness. So in the past, that was allowed potentially on $100,000 um, of home equity indebtedness. That has gone away. Um, for some of these grandfathered rules, the acquisition indebtedness occurred before December 15th of 2017. The new law does allow current homeowners to keep the current limitation um, of the million dollars or the, the higher threshold. So that is good news. Um, but anything closed kind of after December 15, 2017, where interest has been incurred, um, that will be subject to the lower limitation threshold of 750. 
Um, as Jake mentioned earlier, there have been now some additional limitations applied for state and local taxes. This will now be capped at $10,000. Um, <clears> and you, you do still have the option for sales taxes if, if preferred, but um, generally speaking, we find that in income tax usually is, is more beneficial. Um, this will be a big change, I think. Um, it was unlimited in the past, so this certainly can might might look a lot different going forward. Um, something you might also find that, that applies a lot to your loan officers potentially is this next item for miscellaneous itemized deductions. And those basically have been suspended for the items that are subject to the 2% floor. Um, so an example is, you know, unreimbursed employee business expenses. A lot of um, employees might file Form 2106 um, to claim some additional items. Uh, that will no longer be um, allowed. And then as well, you know, an item, an, a good example is tax preparation fees. Those will no longer uh, be allowed as well. So we're going to kick off our last CPE polling question. All right, thanks everybody. Um, so the, the answer for that question was item C or $10,000 for the new limitation. Um, so I, I did wanna just say as we go forward here and we know we're getting close on time, there's just a lot of information. We're probably gonna try to go a few minutes over just to try and get it all in, but if you have to pop off, um, you will get the slide deck afterwards. So um, you know, let us know if you've got any questions after uh, if, you, if you need to look that over later. So some uh, additional updates for individuals um, are changes to the alternative minimum tax. Um, so this has been retained for individuals, as Jake mentioned, but it, it's sort of been modified. Um, temporarily through 2025, the exemption amount has been increased to 109,400 for joint filers um, and 70,300 for others. Um, the, in comparison, the old exemptions were 84.5 for joint and 54.3 for single. So definitely a significant increase there. Um, and then also the, the new law raises the exemption phase out levels so that um, basically AMT will apply to income levels of a million dollars for joint filers. So you'll see some uh, inflation adjustment changes going forward on these as well. Um, the Affordable Care Act individual shared responsibility requirement has also been repealed, uh, making that payment amount zero, and um, the change will be effective for penalties assessed after 2018, and this repeal is permanent. Um, some other changes uh, relate to carried interest. Um, under the new law, the holding period for long-term capital gains um, has been increased to three years with respect to certain partnership interests transferred in connection with the performance of services. Um, again, here noted the prior law holding period was more than one year, so a significant increase here. Um, just keep that in mind if you have any um, situations where this might apply. Um, this last item here on this slide um, is, is good news. Um, so for tax years after 17 and before 2026, um, the Keys limitation, which I'll go into a little detail um, on itemized deductions, has been suspended. So that's, that is good news. Um, under pre-act law, um, certain taxpayers who itemized were subject to a, this uh, limitation known as the Keys limitation um, if their uh, allowable amount of itemized deductions kind of hit certain thresholds. So it potentially could have been reduced by 3% of the amount of the taxpayer's AGI exceeding certain amounts. Um, so overall, this, this um, adjustment or um, limitation has, has been suspended, so that should help taxpayers uh, going forward. 
So this slide is a very high level um, overview of some of the updates. I think I'm going to kind of skip this and let you look that over at, at your leisure, um, but it covers a lot of what we already touched on here today. Some high level you know, state tax considerations related to tax reform is just to note that states may be slow to finalize conformity and or decoupling rules um, as they move forward, um, especially um, amid you know, knowing that there is going to be a technical corrections bill or hopefully a tech technical corrections bill passed. Um, timing is uncertain uh, on this item, so that's hard to, hard to predict. Um, but roughly half of, of the states imposing an income tax conform to uh, the Internal Revenue Code. Um, and, you know, legislatures can either annually or periodically conform and or um, they can do this on a rolling basis without legislative action. So a lot of moving parts here. Um, just note that if federal income is changed due to tax reform, that state taxable income may be changed as well. And again, it depends on the provision and it will depend on the state. Um, many state decisions to conform um, or decouple from federal tax um, provisions will be highly budget driven, um, considering that states must maintain uh, balanced budgets. So these are some items we just like to, to throw in to stress the importance of since there's high penalties associated with this. It's not really specific to tax reform, but just keep these in mind. Um, for deferred compensation, um, you know, we want to continue the stress of having written plans in place uh, where applicable and to, to watch out for the concept of employee discretion on payments um, as this can undermine plans and it can cause constructive receipt issues. Um, so definitely important to consider this. Like we were mentioning, you know, there's a 20% penalty on this one. So um, be very careful in this area. There's also additional employee reporting related to this um, when there are planned failures. So just be mindful, be careful, and, and plan ahead. Uh, there were updates to restricted stock um, and applicable elect elections um, with tax reform kind of under this 83B and 409A concept, but we won't, we won't touch on that today. Um, this last area is related to the partnership audit rule updates that were actually um, repealed, uh, or the old laws, the TEFRA rules for Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act um, items related to partnership audit procedures. They were repealed with the 2015 Budget Act. Um, but we felt it was important to mention here as they're effective for returns beginning after 2017 and they're quite significant changes. So as a result of, of this repeal, um, these adjustments essentially related to an audit um, to a partnership's items of income, gain, loss, deductions, and credits uh, will be made at the partnership level rather than the partner level. Um, since the new partnership audit rules apply to tax years after 17, in practice, we'll probably likely see this come into play more like 2019 or 2020. Um, and just note that existing statutes of limitations on years, um, you know, 2017 and prior will still have sort of the, the old law as applicable. So um, it'll sort of be a rolling transition. So just keep that in mind. Um, these new audit rules sort of do away with the concept of the tax matters partner, which you often heard referred to on, you know, your partnership tax returns. Um, instead, now the partnership will have to designate a partnership representative. Um, Congress has given these PRs sweeping authority to act on the partnership's behalf and to bind uh, the partnership and the partners without their direct knowledge or involvement. Um, and the PR has sole authority to act on behalf of the partnership in all federal tax assessment matters. So this is a big deal, very important that you pick the right person and have processes in place for this. Um, this PR will be designated on the return and it will be an annual um, selection. And just note that it's, it's complex and difficult to change. So you definitely want to, to revisit this here over the next coming months and, and try to get a good process in place and address potentially your partnership agreements as well. Um, small partnerships will have um, the possibility to opt out of these new rules and this would apply to eligible partnerships with 100 or fewer eligible partners as listed below. So just keep that in mind. Um, we're probably going to see many partnerships electing out of the new audit rules and this will actually force the IRS 
um, to audit partners separately. It will be more cumbersome for the IRS. There is a manner of making the election. You want to make it um, on a timely filed return, including extensions. Um, I would just say to follow up with your tax advisor on this um, and you know, make sure you're really addressing um, how you want to proceed um, on your filings for 2018 and forward. Um, again, here we want to recommend um, partnership agreement amendments to formalize your PR and or PR process, as well as other you know, maybe applicable items in this area. And again, definitely try to do this no later than March 15th of 2019. Um, that's sort of an important date, so to keep that in mind. Um, so again, a lot of material here. Um, we just wanted to say, you know, thank you for your time and attending. Um, if you've got any further questions, we know we've gotten a ton um, through the webinar format, and we'll, we'll definitely try to follow up. You know, we, we ran over, so have limited time here for questions, but we'll circle back and try to get um, answers out for, for those other items. If anything specific, please uh, reach out to Jake or myself, and we'll be happy to uh, follow up with you. All right, thanks, Jake and Gina, for uh, that great presentation on the tax report. As Gina had mentioned, we did uh, note that there are several questions that came through uh, the chat feature of the webinar, and we will certainly be getting back to those individuals uh, as soon as possible. Um, just as we conclude, uh, just a reminder that there will be a survey that will pop up when you close out of the webinar today, and we would appreciate if you complete that survey. And those that qualify for the CP certificates, uh, those will be emailed to the, to the participants in the next few days. And again, just another reminder that today, a copy of today's uh, webinar, both the recording and the slide deck will be sent to all participants. Again, we appreciate your time and your participation in our webinar today. Um, any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to uh, Jake, Gina, or myself, or anybody here at Richie May, and we'd be happy to help you any way we can. Hope you have a great day. Take care.